Well, good morning, everybody. And here we are ready for unit five, and we'll do question one. If I can just ask a simple question, Ryan's iPhone 8, is that an additional student? Ryan, are you not an additional student? OK, so. No, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a teacher as well. OK, great. OK. That's just a good thing to know. Um, I'll introduce myself, and then my colleagues will introduce themselves, and then we'll ask you to introduce yourselves to us. Um, my name is Candida Steele, and uh, I am retired as a judge on the U.S. Civilian Board of Contract Appeals. I handled government contract disputes around the country, and um, I've been with the program for about 20 years as a judge. Um, Kurt? I wasn't ready. I am now ready. I am Lieutenant Colonel Kurt Mabus. I'm an attorney with the United States Air Force. I'm an alum of the program, and I've been a state judge for quite a few years now and a national judge as well. Um, and do we have a, a state representative? Is, is that who I see? A uh, Just wanted to welcome do, the man in the car do, back do, there. Do, do they let people from foreign countries judge on this? Is, are you still in Europe? And so I'll, I'll, I'll note that I am a uh, I'm now in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and I'm a, a law professor at the United States Air Force Academy. That's what this program gets you. Yeah. OK, Mr. Leiter. And my name is uh, Richard Leiter. I'm a professor and director of the law library at the University of Nebraska College of Law in Lincoln, Nebraska. I've been uh, this is my first time judging the national competition but I've been judging state competitions for about 15 years. I'm happy to be here. And so kids, could you tell us who you all are? Hi, my name is Chloe Wright. Good morning, my name is Maya Mahegan. Hi, my name is Ella Purifica Shawn. Hi, I'm Isabella Jensen. Welcome, and your teacher is iPhone 8? I presume. Great. Well, uh, I'll go ahead and... Okay. So go ahead. I'll, I'll go ahead and read the question. For the record, a result of the decision in Wisconsin versus Yoder is that, quote, any parent slash guardian can refuse to let their child go to school beyond the eighth grade or learn about a subject by saying it's against their religious beliefs. Do you agree or disagree with the result of this decision? Why or why not? What words, if any, are found in the U.S. Constitution or in state constitutions that protect the right to an education? And how have courts balanced religious beliefs with other rights? You may begin. Delivering the majority opinion for Wisconsin v. Yoder, Chief Justice Berger noted that, quote, a state's interest in universal education is not totally free from a balancing process when it impinges on fundamental rights, end quote. We agree with the decision in this case. While states can place some educational requirements on students, there is a point where parents also have the right to modify or restrict their child's education if it goes against strongly held religious beliefs. However, we also believe it is essential to consider Justice Douglas's partial dissent, where he writes that children must be able to express their opinions if they're different to their parents. So states should provide a judicial outlet for children to speak on their own behalf. According to the ACLU, the purpose of protecting equal education under the law is to ensure that everyone can, quote, participate fully in the life of this nation, end quote. This implies that one, one of the main purposes of a public education is to create civically literate and engaged students. The compelling state interest of education can be met in the least restrictive way that also promotes religious liberty. In this case, allowing Yoder to opt out of school after eighth grade. In San Antonio Independent School District v. Rodriguez, the court determined that there is no fundamental right to education in the US Constitution placing public education in the hands of state constitutions. For example, in Campbell County School District v. State, or Campbell 1, the Wyoming Supreme Court determined that its state legislature must make funding adjustments to provide an equal, adequate education to all children based on its state constitution. Considering that state legislatures dictate their own education budgets, there can be large disparities in educational rights and funding among the states. For instance, Alabama's constitution written, written in 1901 includes segregationist language in regard to schools. However, Montana's constitution written in 1973 takes a more modern approach to education by recognizing different cultures, guaranteeing that the state is quote, committed to the preservation of Native American cultural integrity. Although the right to education is explicitly defined in state constitutions, 
It is important to consider times when the US Constitution has protected individual rights in public education. The 14th Amendment is most often used to shape public education decisions nationally, and in return, protect the right to an education. Its Equal Protection Clause was used in Brown v. Board of Education to end legalized school segregation. The Due Process Clause has been used to protect a parent's right to direct their child's education as in Pierce v. Society of Sisters, which determined that Oregon could not require students to attend public schools. The Incorporation Doctrine has also partially protected students' civil liberties as in Tinker v. Des Moines. There have been long-standing tensions between religious freedom and education throughout our country's history. The fight began as early as the 1800s with the Bible riots between the Catholics and Protestants and has persisted through the 20th century with cases like West Virginia State Board of Education v. Barnett and Board of Education of Westside Community Schools v. Emergence. These instances show how, when it comes to religious expression, individuals' rights within schools are often prioritized over state education laws meant to benefit the common good. Similar to students' individual rights, courts often lean in favor of religious beliefs when balancing them with other rights. Religious liberty has been prioritized over civil rights, as in Masterpiece Cake Shop v. Colorado Civil Rights Commission, where the court ruled that a bakery owner could refuse service to a gay couple. Religion was prioritized over women's health rights, as in Burwell v. Hobby Lobby Stores Incorporated, which held that RIFRA exempts for-profit employers from paying for insurance coverage of contraceptive drugs. Even more recently, the right to religious freedom was prioritized over public health with the decision in Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn v. Cuomo, which decided that religious congregations in New York are able to continue to meet even during a pandemic. While the First Amendment's Free Exercise Clause and Establishment Clause are two of the most integral freedoms protected by our Constitution, throughout history, we've seen a continuous struggle between religious liberties and other freedoms outlined. Time. Beautiful. Wow. Beautiful job, thank you. Um, you um, talked about the, the Douglas dissent, which was uh, a really nice job of doing so. What kinds of views do you think children should be able to participate in and what, at what age? Well, in the Yoder case, Yoder actually um, was able to share their views uh, with the court because they were of high or about high school age. And, and the reason that um, Yoder was, I guess, um, <coughs> because the child did share their parents' Amish views. So um, we would say probably 13 to 14, maybe in middle school range would be sort of the target age where children start to be able to form their own opinion. Okay. Um, cases like Tinker v. Des Moines, where students were able to use their freedom of expression in schools, and that was also around the same high school age. Well, if I can follow up on that, so um, I agree with your ideas about, about where it would be, but the law needs something often that's a little bit more clear cut. How would you determine when the student is ready to make those decisions? Or, or would it be an arbitrary cutoff date? Yeah. This is called the presumption of legal competence in children. And that's that children under the age of 16 can consent to their own treatment if they're believed to have enough intelligence. So we do believe that under the age of 16, the children, if they're competent enough, should be able to have a part of this decision. So I think the age that we would go with is 16 most likely because that's the presumption of legal competence age. And this is known as Gilead competence and someone with parental responsibility um, could make the decision, but the children should also have a say. Thank you. I wanna take you back to your uh, opening statement where you, you, you agree with Yoder. Um, do you think, and I, I want to compare and contrast with, with the Supreme Court's recent jurisprudence or somewhat recent jurisprudence of um, Employment Division v. Smith, uh, do you think Yoder would survive the Smith test or, or do you prefer one test over the other? Um, I, I do believe that Yoder would provide, would survive the Smith test. I think that we can look to the idea that, um, in the Yoder decision, 
exempting Yoder from school after eighth grade didn't have any impact on other students. So that was really just sort of localized only to impacting Yoder. Whereas um, when we look at the Smith test, I think it's really important to consider when we make religious exemptions, do they impact other groups of people? So for example, in United States v. Lee, where an Amish farmer said that he wasn't going to pay social security taxes because he felt that it went against his religion, the United States Supreme Court said that actually doesn't stand up because then you're disenfranchising all of these other people who rely on social security. So people have um, freedom to exercise their religion when it doesn't infringe upon other people's rights, such as in Lee. And another example of this could be Burwell v. Hobby Lobby. And because in Burwell v. Hobby Lobby, they exempted for-profit employers from providing contraceptive drugs for female people that they have employed. But that doesn't mean that these women can't go elsewhere to get these contraceptive drugs. So while it's like limiting the providing them of it, it isn't limiting their access to it entirely. And I think another example of this would be Kim Davis, a marriage clerk in Kentucky who refused to marry a gay couple, but instead the gay couple had to go through a different clerk. So there are ways for people to still attain their rights, such as the right to marry without having, and people can still exercise their religious freedom, such as the clerk Kim Davis. Okay. Mr. Leiter. Um, I'm just thinking about the, um, your answers. I, I, I'm trying, I'd like to explore um, a little bit the separation between church and state. When um, can the state interfere? And let's bring it to modern um, day. How would you feel based on what we've been talking about, um, a family's objection to vaccinations and uh, schools uh, requiring vaccinations in order for students to return to school? Where is the balance between what the state can uh, require? So for this issue, we would go back to Jacobson v. Massachusetts, which determined that Massachusetts schools could mandate the smallpox vaccine in 1905 for its students in schools. So if it's the least restrictive way, we do believe that schools can mandate children to be vaccinated, but there must be a roundabout way for students to still achieve that education, which in today's modern day, we would see with the COVID pandemic would be having virtual school. Yeah, is it the least restrictive means to require a vaccine? If we can do this Zoom competition, isn't that the least restrictive means? Hasn't technology um, obviated Jacobson? Well, you could take Anarco County, Virginia, for example, we have a hybrid school system where students that want to go in person can go in person. And if schools were to require a vaccine, they could require a vaccine and then those people would attend in person, but you still have the hybrid classroom where students that, for example, don't want the vaccine or can't go to school in person are able to still get the same education by staying at home over a technological call like this. And it's also important to note that um, under IDEA, so the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act of 2004, we do have to provide equal education for all students, regardless of their different abilities, disabilities, sorry. Um, so students with disabilities, especially severe developmental disabilities, might not be able to get that equal education at home. So requiring the vaccine so that those students can return to school is actually very important. And, and that would be the least restrictive way so that their, in, their education is not impacted by the pandemic and trying to adapt um, those students to virtual learning when they may not be able to. And then it's also good to look at cases like Berg v. Glen Cove City School District when thinking about the vaccines, because in that case, there were religious exemptions from students who were able to go to school without getting vaccinated, but that was because they did have herd immunity. So although COVID isn't um, at the herd immunity point right now, in the future, we could see similar cases happen for COVID. Great. Um, are we about to be out, Matt? Should I ask another question? About 30 seconds left. Uh, I'll try. Um, I've got one, Canada, real what, quick, because no. this, this is a fairly brief one. What is the appropriate test? The court's been all over the map, intermediate, minimum, or strict scrutiny. What's the appropriate test for free exercise clause question? We think that strict scrutiny would be the appropriate test there. 
States must have a compelling. You can finish your sentence, Maya. States must have a compelling state interest to uh, restrict the right to religious freedom. Fantastic job. Just Wait, fantastic. Good job. Really you. great. Thank you. Kurt, do you want to start us off? I'm sorry, you were going. Nope, not a problem. I just happen to be looking for a different set of notes, but uh, the notes that I need are, are right in front of me. So um, thank you all very much. Well done. Uh, you, what, what I really appreciated was your scope of, of your argument. And um, you, you touched on a lot of different constitutional issues that I think are impacted. So the free exercise clause uh, has, a, has a wide ranging impact because it, it can touch so many different things. And, and you were able to incorporate a lot of those conversations and in fact, overwhelm us with that because there's a lot of different questions that, that I wanted to follow up on with your original um, with your original opening statement. So well done there. Thank you, as always, for bringing into your answers uh, precedent and authority. So I appreciate what your opinion is, and especially when you can link it to precedent. It just it just enhances your argument. You all did a, a wonderful job with that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Richard? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I echo everything that Kurt said. I was extremely impressed with the way your answers were citing to uh, previous cases that weren't mentioned in your opening uh, presentations. You ha obviously have got a treasure trove of research that you did to prepare for this, and you're very um, and you understand uh, the tools that you've got in your toolbox to make these arguments. Arguments I thought were really clear, articulate. Um, I was very impressed and um, gratified as a law teacher to um, see young people have this kind of understanding and this kind of comfort level with constitutional analysis. Good job. I agree. It was just a great job, kids. Um, one of the things that's really interesting is to see whether a follow-up question gets you a whole level deeper and and you showed that many times wow. yes and there were, there were many things that i really would have loved to have talked to you more about the bible riots i hadn't heard about that so you're about you've educated us a great deal um the uh questions of impact using hobby lobby was really good um you just did a really lovely job of pulling in things that really supported what you were trying to say and um, were un unusual in some respects, but you did a beautiful job of, of giving yourself support. It was really a pleasure listening to all of you. And I hope that you're inspired that this has been a wonderful experience for all of you and that you know you may end up being doctors or lawyers or something down the road. Lawyers would be great, um, mm. but I hope you might think about doing more than just being a wonderful citizen who can uh, vote every time and know the import of doing so and um, tell your family and friends why they should be as well. But really, I hope that this might inspire some of you to represent us down the road. We need people with your understanding of what the government does in the government so that the government can operate properly. Yeah. And, um, any one of you would be absolutely wonderful representing us, and I'll feel a whole lot better in my rocking chair in my nursing home, knowing that you're, you kids have taken over for us. Um, thank you so much for all the work you're doing, and I'll sleep easier tonight. Thank you.